My lecture is entitled William Blake and Abolitionism. There's no evidence that Blake belonged to the British Abolition uh, Society and few indications that he regularly discussed slavery or its abolition. Though Blake was patronized by Joseph Johnson, his attendance at the abolition publishers Tuesday dinners in the early 1790s was limited and no record exists of his interventions, if any. Nor is there any documentation of his exchanges, possibly numerous, with John Gabriel Stedman, the author of an abolitionist book, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's on the slide there, a narrative of a five years expedition for which Blake provided illustrations, as you know. In fact, that text was only nominally abolitionist, arguing for elimination of cruelty towards slaves and not for ending the practice itself. Um, let's see, can you see my hand? Oh, what's happened? I'm not hearing Jason. No, it's my, my apologies, Stephen. The, the, your screen's frozen, so uh, ah, it, it, you may have to tell me to move to the next slide. I'm afraid. Sorry okay. if the screen okay. freezes. Next, next slide, which is a blank. Thank you. In his Life of Blake, composed in 1832, Frederick Tatum reports that after witnessing a neighbor abuse a worker for some minor indiscretion, Blake furiously shouted that the man had no right to treat the fellow with cruelty saying it was, quote, inexcusable even toward a slave. According to Tatum, Blake had an utter detestation of human slavery. At Blake's trial for sedition in 1804, the artist was charged with telling a soldier who had trespassed his property, quote, damn the king and his country, his subjects, and all you soldiers are sold for slaves. That's about it for documented statements about slavery and engagement with, this and engagement with the abolitionist movement. And yet Blake's abolitionism and concern about slavery is evident across the breadth of his writing and art, and not only in a matter, and not only a matter, as Beinman argues, in his rejection of mental slavery or mind-forged manacles. More than a liberal cry for freedom of speech and thought, Blake's abolitionism was material and political. And Blake's character, Los, in the epic Jerusalem, says, I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. He was closer in spirit to Marx than James Madison. The ideas of the ruling class, Marx wrote, are in every epic the ruling ideas, that is the class which is the ruling material force of society, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The ruling ideas are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relationships grasped as ideas. Blake fervently opposed the mental and physical subjugation of the popular classes. Quoting Marx again, to the class which has the means of material production at its disposal. Rejecting mind-forged manacles, therefore, was only part of a wider abolitionism. That was Blake's lifelong project. The story of that ambitious struggle has been collectively told by many outstanding scholars, including Jack Lindsay, Jacob Bernofsky, David Erdman, Il Morden, E.P. Thompson, Michael Ferber, Anne Melora, John Mee, Peter Leinbaugh, Tom Mitchell, Siri McDeasy, and others at this conference. Here I will only offer a few observations about the peculiar nature of Blake's abolitionism and suggest how it might be a resource for the wide variety of current abolitionist movements, including those directed toward prisons, animal exploitation, and markets. Next slide, please. Blake treated the subject of slavery and emancipation as early as 1780 when he drew the nude figure who had become Albion Rose, is the early sketch. Fifteen years later, Blake counterproofed the drawing onto a copper plate, engraved and elaborated the forms and contours, and made two color prints from the matrix. Next, please. They show a young man with curly blonde locks, possibly Blake himself, standing astride a rocky promontory. His arms are outstretched and his hands are like plates, open to receive all. Behind him is a sunburst and rainbow-colored array that clings to his back like wings, as well as a dark abyss to the lower right. The land beneath his feet is a colorful abstraction created by the application of daubs of thickened tempera to the copper plate prior to printing, similar to the technique called decalcomania deployed by the surrealists Oscar Dominguez and Max Ernst. Next slide. I'm particularly pointing there to the bottom section of the Ernst painting, titled, by the way, in English, Napoleon in the Wilderness. Next slide, please. The uncolored second state of Albion Rose, probably dating from about two decades later, is more sober. It contains a date, 1780, and an inscription recalling the event, as we'll see, 
that likely precipitated the original drawing. The legend at the bottom reads, Albion rose from where he labored at the mill with slaves, giving himself to the nations, he danced the dance of eternal death. Blake rehearsed a similar line in a letter to William Haley from October 1804. He wrote that prior to Haley's patronage, he'd been, quote, a slave bound in a mill among beasts and devils, but was now again enlightened with the light enjoyed in youth, end quote. The source for Blake's phrase, a slave bound in a mill, is Milton's Samson Agonistes. O oh, glorious strength, put to the labor of a beast, debased lower than bond slave. Promise was that I should Israel from Philistine yoke deliver. Ask for this great deliverer now and find him eyeless in Gaza, in a mill with slaves, himself in bonds under Philistine yoke. Next slide. In Blake's Milton a poem, the poet tried another phrase out that would appear in the engraving of Albion Rose. Thousands and thousands, um, sorry, the next slide, please. Um, thousands and thousands labor, thousands play on instruments stringed or fluted to ameliorate the sorrow of slavery. Loud sport the dancers in the dance of death, rejoicing in carnage. Next, please. The figures in the margins of the uh, plate from Milton are obviously based upon Michelangelo's uh, dying slaves or prisoners. Next slide. The dance of death or the dance of eternal death represented for Blake redemption, emancipation from the mill with slaves, that is from the close boundaries of the five senses and from forced or alienated physical labor. In There Is No Natural Religion, Blake addressed the first. The bounded is loathed by its possessor, the same dull round even of a universe would soon become a mill with complicated wheels. In the four zoe, as the character Inian confronts the second alienated labor. He laments how easy it is to forget the slave grinding at the mill and the captive in chains and the poor in the prison and soldier in the field. Mills of every kind, sugar, cotton, flour, paper and water were the fundamental means of economic production in rapidly modernizing Britain and thus for, in, for Blake, highly charged motifs. The introduction to Milton includes Blake's celebrated lines and was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills. Similar formulations are found in Jerusalem. In plate 19, next plate, next, next please. In plate 19, Albion is illustrated, Samson-like, as abject, stretched out at the bottom of the page, his children mourning or else crushed beneath his dead weight. In plate 20, Vella describes how, quote, the slave groans in the dungeon of stone, a captive in the mill of the stranger sold for scanty hire. The illustrations in this page show constellations of vortices, the dull rounds even of the universe, in the middle of the page there, reduced to mill wheels. Mental and physical slavery are thus revealed to be a mutually enforcing negative dialectic. Next slide. But the youth in Albion Rose, conceived almost 40 years before, represents not so much the slave grinding at the mills as the exhilaration of rebellion and emancipation from those mills. 1780, the date Blake retrospectively incised on the second plate of Albion Rose. Next, next slide, please. It was the year of the Gordon Riots, an anti-Catholic protest. Oh, I wonder if I, that's a, uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, was the date of the uh, Gordon riots, an anti-Catholic protest that turned into a broad working class uprising, manifested by attacks upon the homes of the wealthy and powerful. Next slide, please. Thousands of rioters who targeted Nougat prison, a dread residence of 200 people, uh, and it was, became the visible symbol of state repression. Blake would have known its foul reputation. In his State of the Prisons of England and Wales, published by Joseph Johnson in 1777, John Howard described the old prison and the nearly completed new one designed by George Dance the Younger. The builders of old Nougat, I'm quoting Howard, seem to have regarded in their plan nothing but the single article of keeping prisoners in safe custody. Many inconveniences of the old jail are avoided in this new one but without more than ordinary care, the prisoners in it will be in great danger of jail fever. Next slide. 
Blake was swept up, according to Gilchrist, in the very first rank of the rioters in Nougat and long remembered the event. Just as Samson pulled the roof down upon the lords, ladies, captains, counselors, or priests, as well as himself, according to Milton, so did the insurrections bring New Newgate prison, next slide, down upon the heads of its merciless wardens and jailers, and in many cases upon the rioters themselves. When Blake re-engraved Albion Rose sometime between 1815 and 20, the thought of Samson prompted association with another self-destroying Superman, that is, Napoleon. Next slide. The emperor was the subject of a now lost fresco, so-called, by Blake titled The Spiritual Form of Napoleon, last seen in 1876 at the Burlington Fine Arts Club. A detailed description of the picture in Macmillan's magazine and a surviving sketch dated by Bentley circa 50, 1815 to 20, but titled by him Satan Between Two Angels, shows a resemblance to Albion Rose. Both are nude figures with arms and legs spread one foot in the air. Blake may also have been thinking at this time about Jacques David's painting. Next, please. Wildly popular in Britain, Napoleon Crossing the Alps. Uh, next slide. Here's the image reproduced in a painting by J.E. Millay from about 1860. The print in the painting dates from the early in the 19th, early in the 19th century. Both the painting of Napoleon and Albion Rose. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, feature heroic figures pinned dead center in the composition, as if marked with a giant X. Note also that David, next slide, please, who inscribed the names of his heroes on a rock in the left foreground, like that, Blake also, unusually for him, signed his name the hillock in lower left. Blake admired Bonaparte and even subscribed for times to the Napoleon Redivitus myth, the idea that the emperor was killed in 1793 and that John Oswald, the English Jacobin abolitionist and animal rights champion, who was himself killed that year, took his place. Two of the six people convicted of capital offenses for the attack upon Nougat Prison in 1780 were African Americans and former slaves, John Glover and Benjamin Bowsey. They are probably the black figures shown in the middle of the engraving. Next slide, please. Titled, um, An Exact Representation of the Burning, Plundering, and Destruction of Nougat. If you were able to look closely at the image, it's probably small on your screen, you'll see two black figures uh, separated by about a third of the length of the picture that were located in the middle of the picture. A third black uh, person, uh, Charlotte Gardner, was convicted and later hung for her role in a raid on the house of John Labarty in Tower Hill. Well done, my boys, she's reported to have shouted. Knock it down, down with it, bring more wood to the fire, end quote. Glover was equally robust in his encouragement of the mob. Damn you, he allegedly shouted as he banged against the doors of Nougat with a gun barrel. Open the gate or we will burn you down and have everybody out. Bowsey, who, who achieved his manumission in the heart, uh, in the heat of the American War of Independence, was the leader of these sympathizers, according to a government report on the riots. He helped sack and later burn the house of Richard Ackerman, warder of Nougat, warden of Nougat, take his keys, and with his powerful voice and clear commands, organize the crowd to storm and burn both wings of the prison, freeing felons and debtors. After his conviction, he used his wits to obtain stay after stay until he somehow managed an escape. Tall and robust as well as black, he was an unmistakable figure and was quickly apprehended and again imprisoned. However, unlike poor Charlotte Gardner and 49 others executed that year in London, Bowsey and Glover evaded the hangman. Just a year later, in 1781, they were pardoned after promising to serve the naval infantry on the coast of Africa. William Blake, on the front rank of the uprising, could not have missed all this. Was it Bowsey? Next slide, please. Was it Bowsey, leader of the raid upon Nougat, or the redoubtable Glover, whom Blake had in mind in 1780 when he first drew, and many years later engraved, colored, and then re-engraved, inscribed, and printed Albion Rose. Was it Bowsey's progress from slave to freedman, rebel to convict, and finally escapee to pressed sailor that recalled to Blake, Milton Sampson, the liberator, as well as Napoleon? <laughs>
Next slide, please. The burning of Nougat was antecedent to another act of incendiarism against the more literal mill with slaves, Matthew Bolton and Samuel Wyatt's coal-powered Albion Mill on the southeast side of Blackfriars Bridge in Southwark. The flour mill was only five years old in 1791 when it caught fire. Uh, next slide, please. Or more likely was set ablaze. The flames fanned, according to the cartoonists, by Satan himself or his minions. During its brief period of operation, the mill was a symbol of greed and oppressive labor. It dominated the London market, frustrating industrial rivals, and angered workers who claimed it took jobs, drove up bread prices, and produced adulterated flour. Because of its proximity to Blake's home and studios in Lambeth, and general notoriety, it's often supposed that the mill inspired the, books, the poet's lines about dark satanic mills. Indeed, Blake would have passed the building on his walks to Joseph Johnson's offices at St. Paul's Churchyard, as well as other destinations in central London. In addition, the artist who produced one of the most popular images of the fire. Next slide, please. Samuel Collings collaborated with Blake a few years before in uh, illustrations for the Wits magazine. The dancing man at the right in Collings print wears a ballad sheet that bears the lyric, success to the mills of Albion, but no Albion mills. Next slide. And finally, it should be noted that Albion Mill, with its stripped down Palladianism and lower story rustication, bears a resemblance to the central pavilion and interior court of Dance's Nougat Prison. Indeed, it was a kind of prison. The functionalism of Albion Mill marked it as an early example of the architectural utilitarianism, the preferred form of workhouse, prison, hospital, unitarian chapel, factory, and housing block decried by Augustus Welby Pugin in his book Contrast. Next slide. During its brief period of operation, and for at least a century after, half, at least half a century after, Albion Mill was a significant monument in the mental and physical geography of London. Next slide. Just prior to the fire, it was the visual hub of Robert Barker's 1790 panorama. A decade later, next slide, it served as the approximate uh, middle uh, for Thomas Girton's Idle Metropolis. And 10 years after that, next slide, it was depicted as the archetypal fire in London by Thomas Rowlandson and A.C. Pugin, uh, Pugin in William Henry Pine's Microcosm of London. We've seen that between the first drawing for Albion Rose in 1780 and the epic Jerusalem 40 years later, Blake regularly invoked the twin themes of slavery and emancipation and imprisonment and release from bondage that this dialectic was both mental and physical, and that it was often negative. It didn't resolve into a synthesis that promised redemption. That's apparent as well. Next slide, please. That's apparent as well in Visions of the Daughters of Albion and America Prophecy, published in 1793, the same year that a bill for abolition of the slave trade was narrowly defeated in Parliament. Visions begins as a dirge for Atlantic civilization. Enslaved, the Daughters of Albion weep, a trembling lamentation upon their mountains, in their valleys, sighs toward America. Blake's frontispiece of the manacled figure of Bromian shows a tortured man in some copies apparently black, who is at the same time a slaver. Captive Uothon, bound to him, is like all his slaves, quote, stamped with my signet ring, Bromian says, are the swarthy children of the sun. They are obedient, they resist not, they obey the scourge. Next slide. In the frontispiece of America, Blake depicted a winged giant chained to a stone slab, his head bowed between his knees. Beside him, naked Uothon again, soft soul of America, sits on a carved block protecting two children. The giant is Orc, personification of energy, who has passed the torch of revolution from America to Britain, igniting the Gordon riots in a flaming Nougat prison. The ruined city gate in the print, perhaps the new gate after which the prison was named, and from which the first Nougat prison was built, recalls the well-known line from Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell, written at about the same time. Prisons are built of stones with stones of law, brothels with bricks of religion. It also invokes Rousseau's famous opening line from the social contract, man is born free, 
and everywhere he is in chains. When man thinks himself the master of others, for remains a greater slave than they. Next slide. The depiction of the manacled orc in America recalls a pair of prison scenes by Joseph Wright of Darby that depict an episode from Lawrence Stern's novel, A Sentimental Journey Through France and Italy, in which the protagonist, Yorick, shown here at the right, imagines himself locked up in the Bastille for having lost his passport. Next slide. Both pictures, both versions were engraved, and it's likely that Blake knew them. Another possible visual source for Blake was an engraving by Francesco Bartolozzi, based upon a drawing by George Romney. Next slide. For William Haley's Ode to John Howard, it shows the great prison reformer standing at the base of a stone stair, bestowing a benediction upon a twisted and suffering wretch, manacled hand and foot. Blake had a strong interest in Romney. He engraved his portrait for William Cooper's biography, and of course in Haley. So again, it's highly likely that he knew the engraving. So though Blake may have drawn some inspiration from both Wright of Darby and Romney's compositions, his understanding of imprisonment and liberation was more subtle and complex than theirs. Dungeons and prison cells, Blake proposed, could be found in, dull, in full daylight on the streets of the capital city itself. In his poem, London, from Songs of Experience, Blake alluded to the prevailing atmosphere of anti-Jacobin oppression by describing the chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. The word chartered meaning exclusive, a granting of rights to a privileged group and denial of them to another, as well as the restriction of intellectual and expressive liberty. In every voice and every band, the mind forged monocles, manacles I hear. And a few years later, after accepting Haley's invitation to stay for an extended period in a guest cottage at Feltham, Blake wrote that he had been liberated from the manacles of London's Dungeon Dark. Next slide. In Play 2 of America, uh, we see Orc, feet and hands chained to a rock. Uh, sorry, next slide. Uh, we see uh, Orc's uh, feet and hands chained to a rock like Prometheus, punished for his defiance of a superior power. His posture is that of the freed slave named Neptune, shown, bound, and broken on a rack in Blake's plate for John Gabriel Stedman's narrative. Next slide. But the most expressive image of slavery and emancipation undoubtedly is America in plate six. I quote from it, the morning comes, the night decays, the watchmen leave their stations, the grave is burst, the spices shed, the linen wrapped up, the bones of death, the covering clay, the sinews shrunk and dried, Reviving shake, inspiring, move, breathing, awakening. Spring like redeemed captives when their bonds are burst. Let the slave grinding at the mill run out into the field. Let him look up into the heavens and laugh in the bright air. Let the enchained soul shut up in darkness and in sighing, whose face has never seen a smile in thirty weary years, rise and look out. His chains are loose, his dungeon doors are open, and let his wife and children return from the oppressor's scourge. Uh, next slide, please. The first few lines of this passage may have been inspired by a passage in Otaba Koguano's 1787, Thoughts and Sentiments on the Evil and Wicked Traffic of the Slavery and Commerce of the Human Species. Both writers mention Watchmen and describe the drama of a rising and awakening. I quote from Koguano's thoughts, quote, O beloved, O beloved, should your watchman sit still when they hear that the enemy is invading? Are they all fallen asleep and lying down to slumber in assimilation of the workers of iniquity? Should not those who are awake arise and give alarm that others may also arise and awake? Kuguano's book, the first anti-slavery text written in English by an African, was published this year that Blake wrote his satiric An Island in the Moon. There, Blake satirizes his teacher and friend, his society portraitist, next slide please, the society portraitist, miniaturist, and mystic Richard Cosway and his wife, who Blake notes had black servants lodged at their house. That's a quote from Blake. Uh, one of them was Cuguano. Next slide, please. Represented in an etching from about 1790, probably by Rowlandson, which I show at the left, and a portrait at the right, probably Cuguano, uh, but not certainly. 
Blake knew uh, um, knew him, uh, that's Cuguano, by his visits to Causeway, and may have read his book. There was also a good chance that Blake ran into Cuguano on the street from time to time. The African chapel in Hopkins Street, attended by Cuguano, is just one block south of the Blake family home and business on Broad Street in Soho. Next slide. Blake's representation of the young man with splayed legs was derived from the Barberini Fawn, carved in marble in the Hellenistic age and rediscovered in the early 17th century. The sculpture is mentioned by Winkelmann, beautiful with a simple, unconstrained nature, and is widely reproduced. For example, next slide, please. In this engraving by Robert Odenaire from 1704, with legs wide open and head thrown back, the fawn is both vulnerable and erotic. Recalled here Blake's line from Proverbs of Hell, the head sublime, the heart pathos, the genitals beauty, the hand and feet proportion. Next slide. The sleeping fawn is nevertheless a quite different figure from Blake's youth. The latter, according to the poet, has torn away his brutal shroud and burst from his grave, reviving, shake, inspiring, move, breathing, awakening. He is Oruk, the demonic spirit of revolution, who would inspire the creation of Mary Shelley's similarly thonic and monstrous figure in Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Shelley's creature, however, is significantly less idealized, though he too emerged, next slide please, though he too emerged from the grave, his bones and sinews retained the shriveled skin and pale pallor of death. It was as if Shelley was imagining all the things that might go wrong if Blake's orc in reality shed his grave linens and came to life. Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein narrates the scene, and I quote, it was on a dreary night in November that I beheld the accomplishments of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless things that lay at my feet. By the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard and a convulsive motion agitated his limbs. How could I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, but these luxuriances only formed a more harder contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips." End quote. Shelley must have known Blake's America, though there was no evidence the two ever met. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was well acquainted with the artist, and she was on intimate terms with Blake's friend, Henry Fuseli. Uh, Blake is damn good to steal from, Fuseli famously said. Blake's unpublished poem, Mary, from the Pickering Manuscript, may have been an homage to Wollstonecraft, though the evidence for that is disputed. The association between Orc and Frankenstein's monster is even more apparent if we look forward a few years. In 1831, next slide, The German artist Theodor von Holst produced an image of the monster that, following Fuseli's advice, was stolen from Blake. Similar reclining figure, splayed legs, slumped shoulder, hand behind the head, skull and bones, and light entering the scene from the upper right. Von Holst was a student of Fuseli and copied multiple motifs from Blake, including the frontispiece image of Los in the Gothic doorway from Jerusalem. Next slide, please. Holst probably also saw Blake's books in the collection of Fuseli, or more likely his friend, the artist, connoisseur, and critic Thomas Griffiths Wainwright, who is a friend and supporter of Fuseli, of Fuseli and Blake, and who owned copies of America, Europe, Jerusalem, and other works. Uh, next slide. Here's a work by Wainwright from the 1820s, when he was in most frequent contact with Blake. The drawing recalls the work of Edward Calvert. Next slide one of Blake's informal students among the so-called ancients. Wainwright was also, what happens, a serial killer, poisoning with strychnine a young girlfriend, two fathers-in-law, a sister-in-law, a mother-in-law. He escaped hanging, but was transported to Tasmania in 1837 after conviction for fraud. He perhaps took too literally his friend's proverb, suitor murder an infant in his cradle and nurse unacted desire. Next slide, please. From the beginning to the end of his career, Blake was deeply engaged in the issue of slavery and emancipation, bondage and liberation. 
To just say that he was an abolitionist in the conventional sense is mistaken for several reasons. First, because he never did any actual work for the abolitionist movement, unless you count the engravings he made for Stedman's notionally abolitionist narrative. The reason for his disengagement from the abolitionist movement, however, wasn't lack of commitment. Tatum must have been right about Blake's utter detestation, as he said, of human slavery. It was rather his disdain for the liberal radicals, as MacDesey calls them, who populated the ranks of the abolitionists, who condemned slavery, but accepted the authority of kings, aristocrats, ministers, parliament, military, and the emerging class of industrialists. Blake also rejected the liberal values of individual rights, respect for property, and rationalized religion, theorized by Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Franklin, and Paine. In his 1827 annotations to Thornton's newly translated Lord's Prayer, Blake, Blake penned his own version of the devotions. He writes, give us this eternal day our own right bread and take away money or debt or tax as we have all things common among us. Everything has as much right to eternal life as God who is the servant of man. Um, I think next slide. The passage opens up another perspective on Blake's abolitionism, that he endorsed what the contemporary legal theorist Gary Francione calls the abolitionist approach to animal rights. The idea, quote, that it's wrong to inflict suffering or death on animals merely because we derive pleasure or amusement from doing so, or because it is convenient to do so, or because it's just plain habit. We don't know if Blake was a vegetarian, but in the marriage of heaven and hell, he includes among the proverbs of hell, quote, all wholesome food is caught without a net or trap. To Blake, sheep, cows, frogs, ducks, eagles, flies, beetles, worms, lambs, tigers, dogs, elephants, and crocodiles possess the same capacity for universal being as humans. In The Fly, which you show here at the left, from Songs of Experience, Blake argues that flies are like humans. Am not I a fly like thee, or art not thou, uh, thou a man like me? Similar sentiments are contained in On Another's Sorrow from Innocence, and the cloud and the pebble, illustrated here at the right, from experience, with its illustrations of sheep and cows drinking above the written verses, and frogs, ducks, and snakes cavorting below. These animal abolitionist sentiments were taken up at length in the book of Thel, as Jacob Levitin has recently discussed. Then Thel, astonished, viewed the worm upon its dewy bed. Blake writes, next slide, please. Uh, Blake illustrates the figure as a worm child, a human worm child, with Moses among the, like Moses among the bulrushes at right. And in Auguries of Innocence, Blake wrote, A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. A dove house filled with doves and pigeons shudders through, through all its regions. A dog starved at its master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. Finally, Blake's abolitionism must be seen as a milestone in what world systems theorists like Emmanuel Wallerstein called anti-systemic thought. The idea that the lower strata should pursue transformation of the system as rapidly as possible, guided by a democratic ethos and an egalitarian ideal. The idea was a feature of the 17th century English radical and an ant antinomian thought that so influenced Blake as Thompson, me, McDesey, and others have shown. The ranters and true, revel and true levelers or diggers, for example, so to abolish private property. The blessings, the blessings of earth shall be common to all, said Gerard Wynne Stanley. There shall be no buying, nor selling, nor fairs, nor markets, but the whole earth shall be a common treasury for every man, end quote. These ideas reemerged in the late 18th century as a retort to the ersatz radicalism of Paine, Thelwall, and the London Corresponding Society that demanded political rights, but upheld the sanctity of private property and the forms and functions of the state. Rejecting free trade, laissez-faire, and the commodity form, Blake claimed, like Winston Stanley, that everything that lives is holy and without price. Next slide. In the Laocoon, Blake inscribed at the top, where any view of money exists, art cannot be carried on, but war only. In Blake's 1827 letter to Cumberland, he wrote, each line or lineament is itself and not intermeasurable, with or by anything. But since the French Revolution, Englishmen are all intermeasurable one by another, certainly a happy state of agreement to which I, for one, do not agree. Blake wasn't questioning the fact of the intermeasurability 
or exchangeability of commodities and labor under capitalism, something highlighted by Adam Smith in Book One of The Wealth of Nations. Instead, he was challenging its moral basis. His deployment of the term intermeasurable anticipates Karl Marx's discussion of the commodity form in the first chapter of Capital, published 40 years later. The diversity of commodity measurements arises partly from the diverse nature of the objects to be measured and partly from convention. It is the utility of a thing for human life that turns it into a use value. In the form of society, which we are going to examine here, they form the substantial bearers at the very same time of exchange value. Next slide. Blake's disparagement of exchange value over use value was a constant in his writing. In plate six of There is no natural religion, Blake writes, if anyone could desire what he is incapable of possessing, despair must be his eternal lot. In the first book of your reason, at the right, the same shackled figure is seen, uh, again, pulling his hair, but now he is your reason. And the, ca the corresponding text is, why live in unquenchable, bur unquenchable burnings? Uh, next slide. In For Children and later For the Sexes is found the remarkable diminutive engraving, I want, I want. And in the book of Job, Job is shown in plate 13, stretched out on a slab with God's right hand pointing to the stone tablets of the law and to the left uh, at the flames of hell below. And at just this moment, God spies God's, Job spies God's cloven foot and the serpent of materialism coiled around God. Now Job understands that freedom requires a rejection of money and greed and an embrace of sharing, imagination, and forgiveness. The real slave is the one who's ruled by what Marx called the sense of having. Blake's abolitionism, anti-slavery, anti-prison, anti-liberal, anti-animal exploitation, anti-markets, and anti-capitalist is antecedent to several 20th and 21st century abolitionisms. His rejection of money and markets places him in the camp of market abolitionists such as Michael Albert and Robin Hannell, who in fact cite him in their works on participatory economics. His anti-slavery and pleas for toleration all must love the human form in heathen, Muslim, or Jew, place him in the, in the lineage of W.E. Du Bois, who wrote about abolition democracy, the short-lived cooperation between working-class whites and freed blacks during the Reconstruction period. His abhorrence of prisons associates him with the prison abolitionists, Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who would dismantle the American carceral apparatus as hopelessly racist, exploitative, ineffective, uh, unjust, and cruel. The challenge of the 21st century, Davis writes, is not to demand equal opportunity to participate in the machinery of oppression. Instead, it is to dismantle those structures of racism and oppression that uh, uh, and, to their, and to then extend freedom to the masses of people. If we extend to that freedom, a commitment to share, quote, all things common among us and an embrace of everything that lives, we'll have a summary of Blake's abolitionism. Thank you.